Hi, uh, my name is Derek. I'm your instructor for the uh, Operating Systems class. Um, today is kind of like the second video in, in the series about concurrency. Um, so we're going to be looking at, um, at, at, at how we, uh, how hardware implements uh, support for concurrency mechanisms, for, you know, for, uh, for making mechanisms to uh, create mutual exclusion um, um, uh, for uh, for synchronization, for concurrency, okay? So, uh, in this video, <clears throat> we want to uh, kind of build from the last video, um, so we want to understand sort of the hardware mechanisms that support building uh, mutual exclusion mechanisms or synchronization mechanisms. Um, and and kind of at the end, though, we want to, you know, you'll see that there's some limitations to what the hardware can do. So that kind of sets us up then for what we do in the operating system software side to complete sort of um, what we need to make a full-blown sort of uh, synchronization mechanism, all right? So, so where we're going with this, so, you know, right now we're looking at hardware. Um, so in this video, we're going to look at, um, you know, we, we kind of already looked at load store and the limitations of using those as, as an atomic primitive for synchronization mechanisms. So we'll look at these others, including um, special machine instructions that are um, available for creating these kinds of synchronization mechanisms. And then in the next video after that, this, this leads us to um, the kinds of implementations of mechanisms at the operating system level. So the high-level APIs uh, for things like semaphores or monitors or mailboxes or things that allow <clears throat> Um, for much more sophisticated um, uh, synchronization primitives, basically, well, synch synchronization mechanisms here. So, um, so as we saw in the previous video, so everything's pretty painful if we only have like atomic loads and stores. So we'll see then uh, just by adding in um, um, uh, some slightly higher level primitives at the hardware level, it improves things quite a bit in terms of building these sorts of uh, mutual exclusion or synchronization mechanisms here. So, um, so it's just a little bit of a review of the last video. So, um, a lock, uh, recall, is something that prevents someone, or well, really prevents like a, a process or a thread from doing something, okay? So, and our basic thing that we want to use a lock for um, is to lock, you know, to, to, to lock up before we enter a critical section or before we access some uh, shared data. And then we're, once we're done with that critical section or that, that critical data, we want to unlock um, our lock, um, all right? And another, you know, important idea that, that we did discuss in the previous video as well, so all synchronization involves waiting, okay? So, you know, as much as possible, you want, when you're creating parallel applications, you want them to be running simultaneously and in parallel, but there are certain things that you have to synchronize, that, that, that you have to pass information back and forth between the cooperating processes or the cooperating threads. And, and, and so whenever you need to do that kind of synchronization, there's going to be some waiting involved. Okay? But we, we would like the waiting to be um, not busy waiting. So we, we'd rather not be wasting CPU cycles continually checking uh, whether a lock is unlocked or available or not. Right. So we'd like to use the operating system to, to put things to sleep and then wake them back up. Uh, when when um, when they should be woken up. Okay. So the first mechanism that we'll look at besides atomic load or atomic store are disabling interrupts. So this is actually the simple solution that that will work. Okay. So and, and this um, 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 would work better than loads or stores. Uh, uh, so um, the basic idea is that if you disable interrupts then you can't, you know, you can't switch to another thread or process. The operating system can't, con can't regain control to do a context switch and switch over to another pre uh, thread or process, all right? So that effectively guarantees that you can create an atomic um, section, you know, so, so a section of code that can't be interrupted in the middle and switched to something else, all right? So uh, disabling interrupts will work, and they used to be used extensively, it's a simple mechanism, easy to use, easy to implement, uh, and, it, and it does guarantee mutual exclusion, but uh, for one reason why they, they, 
they're not used nowadays is they really only work on a single CPU system, okay? So if, if you disable interrupts on one CPU, I mean, that doesn't, doesn't keep the other CPUs from executing. Even if you dis disable interrupts on all the CPUs, the other CPUs could be executing, you know, the code in a different process, right? So, so it still doesn't help to disable interrupts on all the CPUs if you have a multi-CPU system. So, so this is really only a solution for a single CPU, right? Um, and if you do have a single CPU and you're using disabling interrupts, though, you can have um, performance issues, okay? So, so interrupts basically allow you to increase performance. Um, and if you don't remember why, you should go back and kind of read the, the, our textbook about interrupts and things. Um, so, 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 yeah, I mean, there, there are issues with, di with disabling them. Um, uh, another big disadvantage for disabling interrupts, though, is that it, it's you really can't allow regular users to, to, do, to disable interrupts, okay? If you did, the system would become unstable because if you can disable interrupts, you can keep the operating system from regaining control, and, and so you can effectively... Um, control the system at, at that point um, and, and, you know, like, let your program run forever instead of letting the operating system switch between programs and, and that kind of thing, right? So, um, because of those problems, um, um, it, it really doesn't work on a modern multi-processor, multi-car CPU, and even if we only had a single CPU, it, it's still problematic, you know, to allow normal users to disable interrupts, okay? So uh, alternative that's used for modern CPU architectures is that the CPU hardware architecture um, supports um, atomic instructions that are slightly ha higher level than an ato a single atomic read or a single atomic write, okay? So typically these instructions do like a read modify or um, a read and an exchange, okay? So, or a test and exchange. Or some examples, okay? So these instructions read a value from memory and write a new value atomically, okay? So, so the, the important thing about these is that they're also atomic, but conceptually they're doing more than one thing uh, when, when you use the machine instruction, okay? So, you know, these, these are hardware things. So, you know, if, if you became an electrical engineer and were d designing chips, you'd have to learn more about this, right? We learn about this in our operating systems course because our operating system mechanisms for concurrency build on these, these basic atomic hardware structures, uh, instructions for concurrency, okay? So, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, the hardware has to implement this correctly. Um, um, so, I mean, you know, it, it, it's not too tough to do this on a, on a single CPU system, but even on a multi-CPU system, it's really not that tough. Uh, you do have to worry about cache coherence problems, but... Uh, you, I mean, you know, you, you actually have that problem for loads and stores as well. You know, you have to worry about cache coherence. So if, if you've already solved that for atomic loads, you, um, um, you probably have the, the solution in place on the hardware level for an atomic um, uh, synchronization machine instruction like this. So. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, these are nice. So unlike disabling interrupts, they can be used both on a, on, on a single CPU system and on a multi-CPU system as well, okay? And there's no... Um, there, there's no problem, there, there's no security issues involved with allowing regular users to use these kinds of instructions. So they're no more dangerous than a, like a load or a store. You know, having a, a read and a modify combined into a single atomic instruction isn't really doing anything different from doing, you know, a load followed by a modify in, in a non-atomic way, right? So, um, so we're going to look at two of these. Um, so basically, CPU designers have proposed and, and implemented special machine instructions to carry out actions atomically, which make better primitives uh, for building synchronization mechanisms, okay? So for example, I mean, back to the previous video, our too much milk problem, if we had had such an instruction where we could uh, atomically leave and check a note, um, it, as we'll see here, it would have made our solutions much better and much simpler. So, um, the book, our, our textbook talks about two such instructions, compare and swap, um, and the exchange instruction, okay? So, um, compare and swap, um, also called compare and exchange, uh, basically what happens is a comparison is made between a memory value and a test value, 
And if the values are the same, a swap occurs. And if they're not the same, then the swap doesn't occur, okay? But the important thing is that these are carried out atomically, so I probably should have highlighted that as well, all right? So on Intel um, x86 chips and x86 64-bit architectures, I think it was the same on both 32 and 64-bit, the, the, this instruction is called CMPXCHG, that, the, the Compare Exchange Machine Instruction, okay? Um, so here's pseudocode of what a compare and swap or a compare and exchange does, okay? But again, so, so this is just pseudocode. This is just conceptually what happens, but you need to keep in mind that we're talking about a hardware-implemented machine instruction that, that executes atomically. So even though I, and, and the textbook shows this kind of like as a C function, it's not a C function. It's an atomic machine instruction, okay? So the way compare and swap works, um, uh, the, the machine instruction works the same way. It takes kind of three parameters for the machine instruction. So you give it a memory address. So this lock value known as a pointer. So that's just somewhere in main memory that has a value. And then we have a test value and a new value. Okay. So whenever you call compare and swap, it always returns whatever the original value in memory, what I called the lock value is. So notice that we remember what the value is and then we always return that. Okay. Uh, whether we swap or not, but uh, in between what we return, we, we might swap in a new value. So basically what we do is we do a test whether the, the, the old value, the, the value that's currently memory, in memory is equal to a test value. And if they're equal, then we swap in a new value. So we change it to this new value. Okay. So what good is that? I mean, you might, you might ask, so, so how would you use that to implement a synchronization mechanism like our too much milk con concurrency problem? So this is what it would look like, okay? So again, um, um, just a couple things. Again, this is examples from our textbook. Um, so when I have this compare and swap here, you know, again, it looks kind of like a function call. You know, this is pseudocode. It looks like a regular function call C, but you should think of that as calling the machine instruction. So this would execute atomically. So the other thing um, about this is that our textbook uses sort of this notation to mean um, starting off in processes in parallel or equivalently you can think of this as in threads running in parallel. Uh, so in threads uh, that are part of the same process um, sharing memory, okay? So in either case though, we've got a global location memory I'm calling lock here. Um, that's shared, either shared between these processes using some, short, some sort of memory sharing mechanism or is in the shared memory for the threads that are executing um, in the context of the same process, all right? So, and initially, lock starts off at zero. So a value of zero means that the lock is unlocked, and a value of one means that the lock is locked, okay? So this is how this works. So let's say in, instead of 10, let's say n was two. So we just have two processes running in parallel. And let's say process one is the first one to, to run and execute the compare and swap instruction, okay? So, the first, when, when the lock is unlocked, when the lock value is zero, the first process that, that executes compare and swap, remember that, that the lock is zero, so compare and swap is going to return zero. It returns whatever's in memory when you originally call it. But then it's going to compare whether the value in memory is equal to zero. If it is, it's going to swap in a one. So, so the first one that calls when the lock is zero is going to end up swapping a one into our uh, shared memory variable called lock, and, and the the function the, the the machine instruction is going to return a zero. Okay. So notice that we, we use a busy waiting. So 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 you should make a note of that. So this does involve some busy waiting. Right, so if if this was to return a one, um, we would go back and, and call compare and swap again, and we would keep calling compare and swap as long as we keep uh, receiving a one back from calling that machine instruction. Okay, but like I just said, the first process, like process one that comes in here, would actually get a, a zero back. So it, it would swap in a value of one to the lock, zero would be returned, and it would get past the while loop and enter the critical section. And then think about the second process. So if, if process one is still in the critical section when it gets interrupted and the operating system runs process two, so when process two comes in here and does the same thing, um, it would call compare and swap. Uh, com remember, our lock is now set to one, so, so compare and swap would return one. And when we compared the value to zero, um, they're not equal, so it wouldn't swap 
it wouldn't make a difference if it did, but, but it wouldn't do the swap either, right? But since it returns a 1, as long as the lock is 1, it's going to return a 1. Everything that tries to do a compare and swap when, when the lock value is 1 is just going to stay in this busy loop, cycling forever until the operating system times it out and it switches back. So eventually it'll time it out, switch it back to process 1. Process 1 would eventually then finish the critical section and then to unlock this lock, so to release our lock, all we have to do is do an atomic write. So, so here we're just relying on this being translated to like a store instruction, a store machine instruction. So we just write zero back into our shared memory variable, and that would unlock the lock. And then the very next thing that called compare and swap on this memory variable would would enter the critical section. Okay. All right. So you should think about that and, and convince yourself that this will work to implement mutual exclusion. Um, with this compare and swap instruction, assuming that compare and swap is, is atomic. Um, another example of machine instruction I'll go through real quickly. I won't spend as much time on this one. It, it's a similar idea, although it's actually conceptually simpler. It's really just a swap or an exchange is all this instruction. Uh, and again, the Intel architecture uh, actually has both of these. It has the compare exchange and it has just the straightforward forward exchange, which, which just exchanges two values, okay? So the C pseudocode of this machine instruction is, is, you know, you might have written this before yourself. So if, if we give two memory locations or also typically maybe one of these is a register, so we, we might want to swap, or sorry, we might want to exchange the value of a register with a memory to do this, okay? But in both cases, no, this is a pointer, so this is an address in memory or a register address, okay? And then if, if you look at the code, it's just a swap, okay? So, so whatever was in memory goes into temp, you know, go, goes into the, the register. Um, so, so, so whatever in memory ends up in the register for this last one here, and whatever was in the first one gets put over to the second one, okay? So it's simply just swapping those two values, all right? And then if you, if you look at how you would use an exchange, it's, it's pretty similar, okay? So we, we have a shared memory variable called lock, uh, and lock being zero means that it's currently unlocked. Whenever it's one, it's locked. And then what you do for this exchange is that every process has a local variable. So notice key. So, so this, this represents starting off these processes in parallel, and each process is running the same function, but each process would have its own uh, local variables. Okay, so process one would have a key, which is, which is different and local, for, uh, you know, different from process two, which is different from process three and all the others, all right? So all of these start off with, with their key set to 1, and they try to exchange their key with the lock, okay? But again, the first one that calls this would successfully exchange their 1 with, with the 0. Um, and, and, you know, if, if you get back a 0, you, you break out of the loop and you enter the critical section. So that's how you know that you've locked the lock. So you, you set the lock to be 1 uh, because you get a 0 back when you exchange it. Um, and you can be in your critical section. And then if, if you try an exchange with a 1 and the lock is already 1, it, it really doesn't do anything. You get a 1 back, and then you, just, you stay in the busy loop. So you just keep, in this, do, keep doing the do while until somebody changes the lock back to 0 so that when you do try to do the exchange, you get a 0, and you exchange back in a 1 in there, okay? So that, that's all the um, uh, exchange does, all right? So... Um, Kind of uh, in summary here, the, these machine instructions, the advantages and disadvantages, okay? So I didn't talk about these, but um, um, uh, these are applicable to any number of processes on either a single processor or a multiprocessor. Okay, so this works for a multiprocessor CPU. The other thing I didn't mention is that, you know, unlike for our milk, you know, share the um, uh, um, too much milk problem, all these processes can run the same code, all the code is symmetric, okay? So you don't have to have different code for different processes. They can all run um, the same code, right? And again, that's because, you know, the, the, this exchange instruction or the compare and exchange instruction is more high level than just a basic load and store, right? So, so it's more powerful. Uh, oops. Um, so it, it, it's, it's relatively simple, um, and it can actually be used to support multiple critical sections. So what I didn't, another thing I didn't point out is, so within these processes or threads, if I needed a, a separate, different critical section, I could just create another shared memory variable like lo called lock2, right? And I could use that to protect a different uh, critical piece of data or a different critical section, all right? 
Um, all right, but disadvantage, okay? So I already kind of pointed these out. Uh, there is busy waiting still involved, okay? So, so, so even though this, this uh, solution works, uh, it does have to waste CPU cycles as it continually checks and checks and checks to see if the lock is, is unlocked or not, right? Um, and uh, starvation is possible, okay, because basically th there's no guarantee or there's no queuing up on who checks this exchange next. So it depends on the, the, the operating system scheduler on, on which process will, will happen to be the next one to call the exchange when, when the lock becomes unlocked, okay? So it is possible that, that, a, that a process could, could, could get unlock, unlucky or code could be written such that this is so tight that, that a process keeps um, acquiring the lock and unlocking and reacquiring it and getting back in and no other process gets in there. So the other process gets starved, okay? Um, and deadlock is possible also with, with this mechanism. Um, so just for example, if you're using priorities and if like a low priority process, P1, gets into the critical section, but it gets interrupted in the middle of the critical section. And then if a higher priority process, P2, gets to the compare and swap or uh, the exchange instruction trying to enter the critical section, the problem with that is that if the scheduler, the operating system scheduler, if it always, um, you know, if it always goes back to the higher priority process and the P2 is higher priority, so, so P2 will, will, will keep... Um, spinning CPU cycles, checking if the lock is available, it'll eventually time out, but then the scheduler will just reschedule process two if it's higher priority than process one, okay? Thus causing a deadlock, right? So, so that's the disadvantage. All right, so that's basically it for this video. That sets us up for the next video then. So the operating system, we, we, can, we can build on these machine instruction hardware implementations to, um, uh, implement mechanisms like semaphores and monitors at the operating system level to solve uh, especially the busy waiting and the starvation problem, all right? Um, so that's it, and then I will see you in the next video.